Assalamu alaikum everybody. Uh, viewers, we have uh, a panel of uh, anesthetists and also uh, physicians from other specialties to discuss the COVID-19 and how to ventilate a patient suffering from COVID-19, an area where we make a lot of difference uh, because people who end up in ICU, they are the ones who contribute to the fatality of the disease. So we want to discuss the considerations which are important for ventilating a COVID-19 patient. Today I have with me Dr. Uh, Mamun Yusuf from Qatar. Uh, welcome Dr. Mamun Yusuf. Please try and introduce yourself in maybe 15 seconds to the audience. Dr. Mamun Yusuf, please. Uh, hi, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, I'm Mamun Yusuf. I'm working as a consultant in uh, medical intensive care unit in Hamad General Hospital in uh, Doha, Qatar. Um, previously, I was working as a consultant in Manchester Intensive Hospital. And I'm very pleased to join you all together for, um, this, for this discussion. We welcome you here. We have Dr. Irfan Rashid. Uh, Dr. Irfan Rashid, uh, would you please introduce yourself to the panel? Yeah, I'm uh, Irfan. I'm working as a, a GP and a pediatrician in uh, West Yorkshire. I'm also coordinating this uh, uh, webinar and uh, most of viewers will know and they have sent me questions already. Thank you. We have Dr. Rana Hafizur Rahman, a, a very experienced consultant in uh, Please, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hafizur, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, yeah, I am, uh, as mentioned, Dr. Rana Fizur Rahman. I am from uh, Dameside Hospital in Manchester and uh, working as a consultant in anesthesia and intensive care. And uh, I'm obliged for APPS2 and Medical City to organize this webinar. So we did uh, hold a webinar last week as well. So we had some questions left over. We will hopefully try to address them. Thank you. And we have Dr. Tamur Mirza, the ex-president of uh, APPS UK, consultant and anesthetist. Uh, please introduce yourself, Dr. Tamur Mirza. My name is Tamur Mirza, as uh, so it has already uh, mentioned. I'm working as a consultant in based and intensive care medicine at one of the hospitals in Manchester. Uh, we did this uh, webinar last Sunday, and so that's said So a few questions were left over. We're trying to answer those. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate everyone's uh, input and time today. Uh, this webinar is uh, hosted by me. I'm Dr. Sohail Chukta, I'm orthopedic surgeon and Microsoft specialist consultant in telehealth. Uh, my interest in orthopedics and technology, especially telehealth technology, is parallel. And uh, I'm hosting this at the platform of Medical City Online today. So we start with the questions which were left over from last, si last time, and then we can rotate uh, turns to answer more questions. There was a question asked about, a uh, question from Pakistan from Anud Ijaz, Dr. Anud Ijaz. His question was, what is the factor which differentiates between those who are going to recover and those who are not going to recover? And that question, can I ask Dr. Temur Mirza to start uh, on this on this one please. Dr. Tamil Mirza. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a bit of a controversy. Uh, it's it's a good question actually. There's a bit of a controversy here that when uh, the patient is being intubated and when not. I, I gather and presume that this question is addressed towards the intubated level three patient, which is already on the ventilator. So we take it as how when the patient was intubated, whether it was during the early stages of respiratory failure or during the late stages of uh, respiratory failure. So one is if the patient was intubated during the early phase of respiratory failure, the chances are good. Similarly, the younger the patient is and uh, with less or no comorbidities like uh, hypertension, like diabetes, and one of the other comorbidity is obesity. If the patient is not obese and not have these comorbidities, then the chances of recovery are good. At present, the mortality rate, uh, as indicated by one of the London panels, is about 50% in intensive care patients uh, who are intubated and ventilated. 
And Dr. Fizur Rahman, I want to bring you in on the same question. What do you, what role do you assign to be for those who got COPD and who smoke? Do they have a higher mortality? I mean, the figures so far suggest that obviously uh, patients with comorbidities, they uh, have higher mortality and uh, overall, uh, we're not really just saying uh, what happened in the intensive care, but uh, as far as our experience is concerned, we kind of maybe learned from uh, Spanish and Italian experience and we uh, started kind of really triaging early and uh, it's possible that uh, we may be sort of uh, uh, triaging them early enough and maybe selecting our patients carefully. So patients who have comorbidities, they are sometimes sort of, uh, not considered for ventilation. So it's possible uh, that obviously our, I mean, learning from others' experience, we have changed our pattern. So it's a possibility that that may affect our results. Mm -hmm. But yes, patients with comorbidities in general in intensive care normally have got higher, uh, higher mortality. So this uh, particular group probably will not be any different. But having said that, we have seen patients uh, coming and uh, with, without any comorbidities and they still develop severe disease uh, requiring intervention in intensive care. I want to bring Dr. Mamoon Yusuf in this conversation. Same question. In your experience in Qatar, what is the group of patients who are mainly vulnerable and are more in fertility side in ICU? So, uh, I think Qatar uh, is, is quite a unique experience as compared to the uh, other population around the world, especially if you compare the Qatar cohort uh, in comparison to Italian or for that matter for England as well. Because as probably you might know that Qatar has got a very big population of uh, expats. Almost a great person of Qatar population comprises of expats. So predominantly these are those people who have come here to work. So uh, and so and if you imagine someone is working, the majority of them who are here, they are uh, in the labor class as well. So presumably these people are in their 30s, 40s or maybe early 50s. Um, and they are obviously working so they, they are presumed to be fit and healthy. But uh, the other side of the story is that uh, because majority of these people come from low-income countries like uh, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, so they have, have underlying conditions uh, which which are not picked up at early part of their life. Unlike in Western countries where you have very easy access to uh, primary healthcare facilities, so predominantly the patient cohort that we have seen so far, especially when I've seen you, it, it, uh, our age group is much younger. Uh, they are usually in late 40s and they are predominantly compromising of this population. And when they come in, we to find out that they may have undiagnosed hypertension or some of the comorbidities which were not picked up before. So the end result is almost the same. So maybe their actual age is a bit too young, but they are obviously as compared to any other in the 60s or 70s in, in, in a Western country. Um, so yes, uh, as Dr. Um, Hafiz was also mentioning as well, uh, they, they are also considered as people with, uh, with some comorbidities and their outcome becomes very guarded as the disease progresses. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ifan, you have a question to ask to the panel. Uh, please go ahead. Being a GP, you are at the front line. Yes, the, the question somebody... Yeah, go on. The question which I've got from last time, I think a couple of people, that there's Naseem Javed from Rahim Yar Khan. He was asking, what's the post of criteria for a weaning the COVID-19 uh, patient on ventilator? Because he was struggling to wean a few uh, couple of patients. And Dr. Thabur, do you, do you want to take this question? The weaning of criteria from... from well, I think he's mentioned post-op. Am I right, Irfan? He said post-op. <laughs> For somebody is on COVID-19, not post-op. Right. Somebody. On, well, the weaning criteria is uh, as based on. I'll just go a bit uh, historically. Uh, data from China and Italy. They suggest that uh, the patient uh, infrequently they have tried to extubate the patient once the oxygen level goes down to forty to 50, uh, forty to forty-five percent. 
but these proteins invariably were re-incubated. So early extubation mm. is not advisable in these patients. So basically, on an average, they require about 21 days uh, to stay on the ventilator and then slowly wean them off. The criteria is essentially the same. Then when the oxygen level goes down, the sedation is off or to aid in weaning, we, uh, we, we recommend uh, tracheotomies to be done in uh, operating theatres. So uh, that's, uh, that's the criteria. When the oxygen goes down, the sedation is switched off, patient starts uh, to ventilate himself, starts breathing effort himself and uh, the oxygen requirements are low, PEEP is low, then we start in uh, terms of uh, weaning the patient. Uh, Dr. Fizur Rahman, you have any take on the weaning of the patient? Uh, weaning, uh, certainly, I mean, obviously, there were a few considerations as uh, uh, Dr. Amur has uh, suggested that uh, initially, uh, obviously, London was ahead of us in this experience and they uh, certainly suggested that early weaning did not did not work and they had to reintubate quite a few patients. So we uh, were slightly cautious. So we and also, uh, because with extubation there is a risk of uh, aer aerosol. So we kind of really went on the route that possibly we may consider uh, tracheostomies and we uh, draw the line that minimum and any patient who has been on the ventilator for up to 12 days uh, and they are ready and meet the criteria for uh, tracheostomy like having oxygen less than 40 percent having having peep of less than 10 uh, we will be considering for formal tracheostomy so that was, that was one way but having said that there are certain patients who may be ready for extubation early if their oxygen requirement is coming down so what we have done in those, uh, in at least one case, we started them on dexamethasone to avoid the failure of extubation. Because uh, in, from London experience, we mentioned that when they extubated these patients early, uh, because they have been proning and deproning them quite frequently, so there was a lot of edema around the cords, and that led to strider and reintubation. So we uh, tried this patient on dexamethasone for uh, 48 hours before we uh, trial of extubation and we successfully managed to extubate one person at least. Yeah. So, so that is our experience so far. And Dr. Mamoun Yusuf, do you have any say on the weaning philosophy or protocol in Qatar? So um, as far as we are concerned, so weaning a COVID patient or liberating them from the ventilator uh, we are following um, the same guidelines that would follow for any other patient in addition to the infection control guidelines that you would take anywhere for the COVID patients. So as far as our experience is concerned, so, so far um, we have had more than 70 patients in our ICU. Currently we are at 45 patients as we speak. And out of those uh, more than 70 patients, we have uh, extubated successfully about 13 of them. Um, and then, but again, uh, I cannot tell you like what worked or what did not work. There were a lot of things that happened. Uh, it could be the weaning protocol or it could be the ventilator strategy that we applied or it could be the pharmacology, no one knows. But uh, so far, our number are slightly better to what has been reported elsewhere in the literature as compared to Italian or for that, but for that matter, the English experience. Uh, and fortunately, we just had to reintubate only one person mm -hmm. amongst all of that. So, uh, for some reason, our patients are behaving a bit better as compared to um, some of the other, other units around the world uh, as, uh, as far as the extubation, the weaning is concerned. But uh, we, are, we are not doing anything different. We are just uh, carrying on what we normally do for any other patient as far as the weaning is concerned. Whenever the oxygen requirements are uh, variable, the good, good cough reflex, their ventral support in terms of the deep requirements, as well as the respiratory rate is within um, the reasonable rate uh, range, uh, then we, 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 give, we, we definitely encourage them to go for a trial, trial of extubation. Um, I, I want to bring another topic in the conversation which is related to our ventilation protocol. There is a paper that uh, it's the deoxygenation of hemoglobin which is the problem, it's not ARDS. 
no matter how much oxygen you push in. If COVID-19 affects the oxygenation capacity of hemoglobin, it will not happen. So then the inflammatory response starts. And in fact, there is a question as well from Dr. Ajmal Khan saying that, yeah. is it a problem of oxygenation? So please uh, take this question carefully because it's not established yet. So Dr. Tamur Mirza, uh, do, do you want to take this first? Yeah, uh, I think you are absolutely right that nothing is proven as yet. All these uh, questions are based on very uh, small studies. Every, uh, the cohort of this, uh, this, this studies is very, very small. They are, one of the studies was based on 63 patients. The other study was based on a little above than a uh, thousand patients. And they suggest that the, there is, there is a bit of, uh, uh, hemoglobin related, uh, problem, which affects the oxygen carrying capacity rather than, and the, the lungs is the secondary. Uh, infected area or affected organ. First is the blood because the virus attacks some sort of heme portion of the hemoglobin and affects the oxygen carrying capacity. So I think the Dr. Afeer or Mamun will be able to shed more light on this, but this is my knowledge. Uh, this one. Over to you, Dr. Afeer or Mamun. Uh, yeah, I was reading about it and it's a uh, concept. Conceptually, it's uh, interesting, and uh, uh, there was some mention that potentially it is uh, oxygen carrying capacity of the hemoglobin which is affected. And uh, the author was suggesting that we should be using hyperbaric chamber, and that will probably uh, prevent the need for ventilation for in these patients. Uh, I'm not aware where anybody has actually practiced it, uh, but theoretically, that was being suggested because what happens when, uh, so he was equating it to uh, something like carbon monoxide poisoning, that what happens in carbon monoxide poisoning that the hemoglobin is there, but it is uh, kind of really in a state that it cannot bind to oxygen. So in those situations, the only way you can transfer the oxygen to the tissues is by dissolving uh, increasing the dissolved part of the oxygen in the blood and that can only be increased by using the hyperbaric chamber so which I, I would be surprised then uh, and you I mean there are not really many women which will have easy access to the hyperbaric chamber so there may be some close to uh, the sea level sea, sea where obviously they get ships or anything like that or there was a suggestion of maybe using uh, some of the uh, aeroplanes where obviously they can in change the uh, pressure inside the cabin. So, but having that said that, practically it has not been done as yet, or it's, at least I'm not aware of that anybody has tried that. But theoretically, it uh, sounds very uh, sort of uh, plausible. So, whether it will happen or not, uh, it's early to say. In, in fact, uh, Talking of oxygen, I'm going to refer to Dr. Mamun Yusuf as well, but just want to insert a comment. In many hospitals in UK, they're not taking new patients because they haven't got oxygen supplies even. So hyperbaric will be requiring a fairly high concentration of oxygen supply as well. So we, we may fa face a challenge on the supply line as well if you we go that route. Dr. Mamun Yusuf, what is your take on this question, the one I mentioned earlier? Well, there's a very interesting theory which has been circulating around uh, in social media as well, and I've, I've definitely um, seen that as well. So if you look at the theory what they're saying, as Dr. Tamu has already mentioned, that uh, what they're saying is this virus just displaces the, the heme portion and the iron becomes liberated. That's why you see an increase in the ferritin levels yeah. in the blood as well. And, and then you get a cytokine response and then it leads to an inflammatory response in the lungs. Uh, but then there's another part of the story as well. Um, majority of these patients that we see, um, they come in severe respiratory failure and one of the rescue techniques that definitely work in our patient and definitely all around the world as well, which is, is what a better, the majority of our patients have been, uh, have improved remarkably with the prone positioning. So what is prone positioning, just for some of our viewers who have not uh, practicing it, their units is that, uh, especially in Pakistan, is that um, once you have uh, exhausted all your resources on the ventilator, 
and uh, your and then still the patient remains hypoxic. So you turn the patient, you turn them upside down, and the way it works is that it redistributes your ventilation perfusion, and 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 it produces less pressure on the lungs. And the idea is that your ventilation perfusion mismatch improves, and that's how your oxidation improves eventually. So going by this theory, then this uh, hinge theory doesn't make any doesn't fit into the whole thing because majority of the patients are so how can you how can you explain patient getting better on the proning uh, with this hinge theory? So I mean, what I'm trying to say is that it is still very early days. There might be some relationship uh, to this uh, hinge component as well, but just to entirely say that this whole uh, disease pathophysiology is just based on this this bit. I think it's too early and too premature for that matter. Coming back to the second point of your question uh, with regards to the high oxygen demand, that's quite interesting as well. So what initially when um, this disease started, and uh, the people were really worried about uh, uh, very high uh, use of the ventilators. So initially the guidelines, but there were three phases actually. What happened initially was um, they said that because there is increased risk of infection and aerosols, so everybody went on for early intubation. So rather than going on NIV or for CPAP, and let's go for early intubation to uh, decrease the risk of infection to the healthcare workers. And then they found out, okay, we are running out the ventilators now. Let's change the guidelines and then move into the non-invasive ventilation or high flow. When they when they switched on to that mode, obviously if you look at the high flow, it is using six up to forty to sixty liters per minute and up to certain um, area up to eighty liters per minute. Then your oxygen uh, uh, stores within the hospital just started getting exhausted, and now obviously the, this this stock of hyperbaric um, oxygen chamber as well. So I think um, again, uh, nobody knows what is working, but I think uh, especially at this stage when we are uh, dealing with such a um, massive proportion and massive numbers of patient, uh, trying a new intervention which is not uh, so far scientifically proven, I think it's, it's it's I think we have to be very careful. That's a great response. Uh, Dr. Ifan Rashid, do you have any question for the panel? Please go ahead. Yes, uh, I've, got a, uh, I've got a question. Uh, this doctor is not showing us the name, but he's from Ethiopia. And he's asking how do we manage uh, and ventilate critically ill patient where we don't have uh, uh, many resources? So we are, we are talking about a situation when there, we don't have fancy machines, we have very very primitive ventilators. So what yes. do we lose here, Dr. Timur? What is the minimum we need to give that patient? And this is a good question in, in those countries where there's not much sources. Please go ahead. Yes. Um, well, to start with, uh, we, we, we start with uh, non-invasive ventilation. As I mentioned last time that we have a CPAP holds. Uh, just in case uh, if they don't have the masks to tight fitting masks to give them CPAP. So we start from there. So, and the other, uh, as uh, Mahmoud has mentioned, about proning them awake. So, before uh, putting them onto the ventilators, we can prone them while they are awake and tell them to lie there for at least half an hour to an hour or maximum two hours if they can lie on their tummies. Uh, for about this time period. This greatly increase, increases their oxygenation, tissue oxygenation. If they can do that, we can avoid ventilation. But uh, again, this is, uh, this is just uh, a prolonging uh, step. The second thing is that we need just very basic ventilators, which have got a couple of functions like uh, in UK, we use these basic ventilators in, in transportation of the uh, critically ill patients. So if they have got these transport ventilators which have got minimal uh, functions in them like to control as if to control the tidal volume, to control the respiratory rate, to control the uh, peak. So this sort of and, and the amount of oxygenation that we are giving. So basically the, a basic ventilator is required or uh, try non-invasive before uh, putting the tube down. So this is, I mean, this is what the minimum we can do in a very limited uh, uh, resources ICU. Uh, Dr. Afizur Rahman, any suggestions here for our colleagues in Ethiopia and other countries? Uh, yeah, I think in, uh, with limited resources, I think it is a difficult situation for them, definitely. Uh, uh, I would really go back to uh, Mamoun's point of view that obviously 
uh, in such fish areas, I think if we focus on prone positioning early, and also I would like to add maybe that if obviously if they have incentive spirometer, or if they do not have incentive spirometer, maybe if they can uh, consider giving them their patients balloons, if they can inflate balloons. So this old technique uh, with the respiratory physician used to use uh, to keep the lungs inflated and it creates positive pressure within the lungs. So hopefully that way they can sort of modify the disease process. But in the end, if they need ventilation, unfortunately, they will have to find a way to maybe the simplest ventilator to buy time and give the time to for the lungs to heal or before any other uh, treatment can be given. So, so, using, my, so using balloons, when you push the air into the balloon and let the balloon deflate and push it back into your lungs with pressure, is that what you're saying? Naturally, the purpose is that when you're going to inflate the balloon, you have to take a deep breath and hold it before you can inflate. So that is a theory that the respiratory physician tend to use in the past uh, when there were no incentive spirometers and these kind of uh, equipment available. When their patients are recovering after thoracic surgery, they used to encourage them to use that as, as a uh, treatment modality. And uh, they used to believe that it helped with the uh, preventing the atelectasis in the lungs. So I feel the same in, in resource poor uh, countries that can be considered. Uh, and in, in, in my setup here, in patients who are still uh, kind of, we are keeping uh, under watch, I ask them to use incentive spirometer. Right. So if, if always they do not have the incentive spirometer, the alternative is using the balloons. So that is my simple theory about it. So this is, this is you're trying to improve the end inspiratory volume, which prevents the atelectasis. Yeah, and pneumonia kind of picture to prevent. And obviously maximizing the gas exchange in the lungs. And Dr. Mamoun, Mamoun what, what, what is your take on this uh, question? People do not have resources. What else they can do there? So if I understand the question correctly, I think the, the question was that uh, they have the ventilatory support, but uh, they have very limited resources. Yeah. Um, I think the, the, the good news is that um, still nobody actually knows what is working. Okay. For example, um, if you if you look initially um, from the data that came from, uh, especially from South Korea and China, um, they didn't use any of the uh, medication that are currently being used in majority of the countries, and their results have been very good. So uh, first, we don't know which pharmacologically which medicine is working. So even if they don't have all the fancy medicine like interleukins or uh, antivirals and still if they got, I think most of the African countries will have hydroxychloroquine, which again, we still don't know whether it works or not. Hmm. That's the pharmacological treatment. As, well as, as far as the ICU treatment is concerned, I think ICU, uh, good ICU treat, like um, management comprises 70% of good nursing care and 30% of good um, physician care. So I think if they have a good nursing setup to run this ICU, I think that's half of their job done. Coming particularly this disease, I think it's already been mentioned, if, even if they have, don't have invasive monitoring, if they can target uh, saturation levels of anything above 90, I think that's a good start. Again. Most of the ventilators do have PEEP, so they just titrate their PEEP according to the oxygen saturations. Even the task mode ventilators do have the PEEP function. Coming to if if that or everything fails, they can still paralyze this patient because most of the country do have the, uh, the the cheap drugs to paralyze. Again, that will also improve the oxygenation. The last resort is if still this does not work, they can still prone the patient and, and again. The, to prone a patient, you just need a trained team. You don't need any other extra resources. Even if the ICU is not trained, they can always get someone from the operating theaters. For example, the, the people who do the neurosurgery. So I think, uh, again, I must say, it, it is a very challenging situation and um, no one can expect them to become um, an expert in all of these th things. But I think if they try to learn it and, and see what other help is available around them and, uh, and, and seek out these forums, uh, I think um, then obviously they can survive somehow. But again, I, I must appreciate it's not very easy. Well, I think I, I really appreciate the answers and it, it seems that we are very concerned. We are very passionately involved, not only technically 
in managing this uh, COVID-19 assault on mankind. Uh, with this, uh, we, we want to uh, close this program and uh, we will be doing more of this. And I think APPS UK has taken this uh, role to educate, to inform, to inspire as well people that engage yourself in dialogues of knowledge and academy. I think this is the way forward. We will discover more ways to treat. Right now, what we have is, is good enough, uh, but we need to learn more. So thank you very much, all the panelists, uh, Dr. Irfan Rashid, for coordinating this. You always save me a lot of time, so I have a very special thank, thank you for you. Dr. Tamu Mirza, you're very busy in your area and you spare time today. I appreciate your coming in. Dr. Hafiz Rahman, especially I, I see that you've just either going to hospital or come back from hospital or in hospital. And that is again a contribution. I am. You're in hospital. Thank you for joining us and Dr. Mamoun Yusuf from Qatar. Uh, it's very valuable to have your input, very valuable because you give us a different perspective. So I appreciate your very uh, important presence today. And with that, I close this topic, uh, this chapter. We may be starting with a new topic very soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.